So first watch, Steven yeah. Souza Jr. had been to these a million times, loves them. I had never been. So the first time I came here was with Steve when we shot the other cup of coffee this year. I'm all in now on first watch, and now Pretty I good. find out you lived across the street but never made it in here. Yeah, we lived just little little ways north of here and drove by to, you know, hundreds of times and never came in. And we'd planned to come here a bunch but never made it. So I'm glad I'm glad we're finally here. Good morning. It's, it's good, good to, to see, see you again. You again. Thanks. Hi. Can I offer us some Project Sunrise coffee? I would love a hot green tea. Do you guys have green tea? Yes, I do. I'll Thank bring you. that out. Now, last time I had Stephen Susie said have a morning meditation. I thought, do I got to go in the corner and? Go. Chant or something, but no, I'll, they were great. I had two of them. Can I have another one? Absolutely. So how are you doing, man? You're doing well. You're healthy. Doing well, healthy. Yeah. First time in three years. Uh, I know it's been a fun year. Um, very thankful to be healthy and be out there, and uh, especially this time of year. Last year had to be doubly frustrating because you get hit in the hand, Trevor Rosenthal. Yeah. Then you're close to rehab, and you're I almost know. back. You go to Reno, you get hit in the wrist, and that's it. It was frustrating for sure. I was on the rehab assignment there, and uh, I was going to actually come back after that last game. So I was oh. ready and feeling good and healthy. And uh, my second to last at bat up there, I get smoked again. And uh, it was almost a, an identical spot, just a couple inches lower. And, um, you know, just part of the game, unfortunately. It was tough being at home, going through surgeries, and, and having a young one year old son. And, you know, he wanted to get picked up and held. And, you know, <laughs> Me play with them and all that kind of stuff. There are times where I couldn't, so Amanda was huge and uh, just supported me through that tough time. Now you and Amanda have been together a long time now. Oh yeah, right? we started dating in uh, in high school. I was uh, I just turned 17 and she was uh, 17 as well. So we're going on uh, 12 years now and been married for five and uh, have, a, have a beautiful baby boy. Another one on the way. So uh, our family's growing and. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. We've well, been, Jackson, uh, right? Jackson, yeah. yeah. He's just turned two. He's so much fun. Just getting to spend the mornings with him before games, and uh, they've been able to travel a couple trips to San Diego and stuff like that. So uh, it's, it's been a blast being a dad. Okay, since oh. Steve's buying, I okay, decided you to bring me one you as well. one. Yeah. I'm excited. Get, so you can try it. Awesome. Morning meditation. Okay, thank, you. thank you. It looks, yeah. looks exotic. <laughs> well, right. It's an Enjoy. exotic Thank show, you. Nick. We got a big budget for this too. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Do you have to have moments or, or check yourself over the course of a season where you go, okay, I'm done being a baseball player. Right now, I need to be a husband. Or right now, I need to be a dad. Yeah. Do you have to find that mode? I try to switch it off as best as I can. Um, you know, I'm not perfect at it, and there's certain times where uh, I, I'll take a tough game home with me, but. Um, I try to turn it off as much as I can. As soon as I, I drive my car home and, and get to the house, I try to completely turn that baseball player mode off and just be a dad and a husband. And uh, that's what my family needs from me. That takes practice, doesn't it, to oh, yeah. be present? You know, I think we're wired in a certain way as athletes to to be focused and uh, be driven. And you know, you have a good game, you want to think about doing it again, or you know, you have a tough game, you're, you're beating yourself up over it at times. And you know, wanting to get to that next game and seeing how you can improve. But the sweet spot is just being present in the moment, knowing that, you know, thinking about the future is 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 tough because you don't know how many days you're going to get. You know, you don't know, like myself, if you're going to get injured, unfortunately, like part of the game. Um, so you just try to stay present, whether you're at home or at the field. And uh, I'm sure you, you deal with the same stuff, too, like everybody. That's a very zen attitude. I mean, I, I don't mean that in a, in a snarky way. That's an Eastern philosophy of awareness and yeah. attachment and being present. It's hard, especially with everything we have going on around us now. Yeah. Here in 2018, it, that's difficult. Yeah, how do, you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, sometimes you have a, what feels like a bad show or a bad game or you, you make a mistake on a call and uh, or you, you have a great game and you feel good about the way it went. Yeah. When I got this job, somebody that had been a baseball beat writer told me right away, he said, and I've always remembered, he said, the thing you're going to love about the Diamondbacks job is the 162. And he was absolutely right. It's the 162 is the best part yeah. because we do this every day. Yeah. And you, you certainly know that. Yeah, it, yeah. That's the beauty of it. There's another game tomorrow. And I find great comfort in that. It's a lot like life. Yeah. You, know, you can have a good day or a bad day and, and Lord willing get to wake up and do it again tomorrow. So my college coach used to say that all the time, whether it was a good game or a bad game. He said that's the best part about baseball. We we'll get to wake up tomorrow and do it again. So it's exciting. It's a cool part of the game. It can be a grind at times if you let it, but um, it's an opportunity. You stay to do something new.
When I got drafted and kind of moved out of the Northeast, I was surprised to hear that no one else shared that <laughs> adjective. We're like, what are you guys, what are you talking about? My wife and I were like, it's just part of our language, it's what we say. You guys need any help looking over the menu? Oh, that acai bowl sounds good. I think I'm going to try that, Can I get please. that one? Yeah. Okay. That comes with the toast, too, right? The almond butter toast. Yeah, that's great. I'll have that. This is really good, by the way. Thank good. You. I'm glad you Another enjoyed it. Another convert to the got, morning we, meditation. We, that's really good. We converted them over. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Now, I was really looking forward to this one, to sit down with you, because I'm from Boston. Yeah. Now, you're from Western Mass. Western Mass. Which is like the sticks to those of us from close to Boston, but yeah. I was hoping for some Boston accents and pock the cars no, and no. you don't have a lick I don't, of it. Yeah, I don't have the, uh, the Boston accent. I do say wicked a lot. Yes, that's a I big Boston wicked. word. Oh, that was uh, wicked hard. Wicked hard. Uh, yeah, when I got drafted and kind of moved out of the Northeast, I was surprised to hear that no one else <laughs> shared that adjective. We're like, what are you guys, what are you talking about? My wife and I were like, it's just part of our language. It's what we say. So we definitely still say wicked, and, and they're going to keep saying that. Amanda still drops a wicked from Oh, all the time. That's awesome. All the time, yeah. See, that, that's good. I feel good about that. Yeah, your accent, you don't have quite as thick of a one as I would have thought from someone from Boston. Has it gone away? Have you, has you I moved was, out you here? You know, it's funny. I grew up in Medfield, Massachusetts, which is the, one of the towns next to Foxborough. Yeah. So right outside of Boston, I went to college at Emerson College right in downtown Boston so I I grew up with it but I for some reason I was very much aware of it yeah like, self-conscious those people sound funny why do they talk <laughs> like that well, you know what really drives me crazy is the bad movie Boston accent like, like the fake one where the actors yeah. aren't yeah like you watch Goodwill Hunting, right? Yeah. And you've got Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. Yeah, now those guys are the guys. genuine yeah, articles. Yeah, yeah. They have it, but then the late Robin Williams had his Boston Fake accent, one. and it didn't. You know, sometimes it kind of comes and goes, yeah. or they push it too hard. Yeah, yeah. I like watching those guys in those movies, and uh, Mark Wahlberg too. I think is yes, got some of that another too. good one. Yeah, it's it's good stuff. But there's those guys have an attitude. Now it's a tough cop movie, mm -hmm. but there is is there a Boston attitude? You know, I get the reputation of. You know, Northeast guy who has the, the blue collar mentality, bring your bring your lunch pail to work kind of, you know, work ethic, I guess. Um, my college coach uh, at University of Connecticut, he recruited what he called a lot of those blue collar Northeast guys. And, you know, growing up a baseball player in the Northeast, we have, you know, a very short window of time to be outside. And we're inside, you know, a lot of our off season, especially in college, we're, you know, training inside and we're running and hitting inside. We don't have the same advantages of people you know, in the West, out here in the South. So um, we have to get creative and, and do some things and maybe work a little bit harder than, than some of the other guys. It's interesting. You have, you know, young guys out here, young kids and high school age kids playing baseball. As you said, they're outside, they're playing 100 games a yeah, year. Yeah. Then you've got Patrick Corbin, who shows up in jeans in the uh, basketball no. gym <laughs> at the funny, baseball huh? tryouts. Yeah. And yet he's the all-star. It, it really is difficult in the Northeast, isn't it? I think if you let it be, I think there's certain advantages too. You know, for me, there was only certain, you know, months out of the year where we could be outside playing baseball. So I was playing football and basketball as well. And I think that helped me a lot, honestly, develop some athleticism and toughness and strength that I wouldn't have had if I was just playing baseball the whole year. So uh, I think if you watch me play, especially defensively, you can see, you know, possibly first step quickness comes from being out on the basketball court my whole life. And things like that. So there's definitely some advantages. Um, you know, I think I try to view everything as an opportunity instead of a disadvantage. Ta -da. Oh, wow. Alrighty, Rue, is I there wish anything? I didn't eat at home. I Fantastic. It's so good. It's all right. At least you get a, get a taste <laughs> in. It'll, it'll yeah. convince you to finish the rest. Burn it off tonight. All right. awesome. Enjoy. Thank you so much. I look at your, your family and I go, wow, okay, here's a brother that went to Harvard. Yeah. Here's a brother that went to Holy Cross, which yep. is a wicked hard school wicked to get into had. in Western yep. Massachusetts. What was that like? Were you, were you the smart one, the dumb one, the I slow was, one? You know, I went to UConn, which um, is not really a slouch of a school by any means. It's nope. a top 30 public university, I think. But I was the dumb one of the three, <laughs> unfortunately. I was just trying to keep up. Come well, on, that's I, not true. Academically, at least, I was... Um, you know, I come home and I was taking these advanced classes I definitely didn't feel qualified to be in. And my parents instilled uh, good education in us. They wanted us to, to have our priorities straight. And um, they always supported us with sports and everything like that. But 
they wanted to make sure before we, you know, would go out and play in the neighborhood, we get our homework done. Um, and I think that was a, a good thing for us and, and helped me um, get the grades I needed to get an opportunity mm -hmm. to play in college. That's fantastic. Where did you go to college? I went to Emerson College Emerson, okay. in uh, downtown Boston. Nice. How did you yeah. like it there? I loved it. Emerson is a very unique place. It was a great experience. Do you guys ever make it back different. there at all? Try to. Yeah. Yeah, we've been back to Boston to play the Red Sox twice since I've been here. Mm -hmm. And that's weird for me <laughs> to be doing a game at Fenway Park. I'm sure. The first time it was pretty freaky. Then it just kind of became normal pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah, I grew up a big Red Sox fan too. And we went there, I think it was in uh, 16, 2016. Yep. I got hurt just right before that road trip. So unfortunately, haven't got to play there yet. Hopefully uh, soon in the coming years. But yeah, it's a, you know, just getting to grow up going to those games, our, our dad would take us, you know, every summer to one or two games, and it was just such a cool experience. You know, the atmosphere is is off the charts, electric always, so um, I'm looking forward to hopefully playing there. It's always reminded me, and it might be the number 13, of Dan Marino. Because Dan Marino never got sacked because he would drop back and he had that just quick, quick release. That's what I see. When I see you throw, I see Dan Marino. Does that mean anything? Well, I've never got compared to a quarterback. That's pretty cool. You're a determined guy, but maybe sometimes Great. a little stubborn in what you want to do. And Nick, uh, yeah, we've talked to Nick about this and always tinkering with your stance. Yep. And then you certainly seem to found the sweet spot now, but to get to where you have gone as an offensive player, yeah. it, it's been tough, hasn't it? You know, early on, I had a vision of, of who I wanted to be as a player and a hitter and wasn't able to do that. But over the last couple of years, I've started to learn and, and learn from a lot of failure um, a lot of really tough times as a hitter and try to implement that and just get a little bit better every day and, and keep things simple. You know, I think hitting can get really complicated at times and when you're up at the plate and you have too many thoughts, you're, you're out before you even step in the box. So. Bob and I, when we watch you play and watch this great season that you're putting together, have, have said, especially lately, Nick right now at the plate looks much less mechanical and yeah. much more athletic. That's seems... exactly what I'm trying to do. So that's, oh, good. That's okay. cool. You guys can I'm glad see we got that, that right yeah, for once. Yeah. But exactly. That's you can on. see, I think, the athleticism where before it was very okay, elbow up, hit, you know, yep. everything was rigid. Yeah. Now you're just kind of flowing up there. Yeah. So our hitting coaches over the last couple of years have taught me some really, really good mechanics. You know, I was, I was very rotational with my swing. I hit a lot of ground balls, pull side, and fly balls the other way. And I had struggled because I knew what they were saying was right but I was implementing it, like you're saying, in a very stiff and rigid way, uh, when now I'm trying to just implement it in an athletic way, you know, and just trying to see the ball in a good position and then let that let that work show up and play. It's showing up. It's yeah. a lot of fun. Thanks. It is a lot it's of fun. It's a lot of fun. The defense, I, I remember when, when the late Kevin Towers was the GM here, and Didi Gregorius was a young guy coming up, and he was the shortstop, and he was going to be the shortstop of the future. And Didi was making diving spectacular, these unbelievably athletic plays at shortstop. And KT would say, Didi's really good, but we got a kid in the minors that's even better. And I would say, better than Didi? And he said, yeah, we got this. He always used to call you Nick Ahmed. We got this kid Ahmed. <laughs> He's special defensively. And it, as all usual, KT was right. Yeah, I mean, he believed in me when, um, you know, maybe not a lot of the people did and, and saw some potential in me, which um, was pretty cool. Um, traded for you. Traded for me. Uh, gave me an opportunity here in the big leagues, which I'm uh, forever thankful for. I just have loved defense for a long time. You know, there's a lot of guys in baseball who love hitting. I think hitting can at times be more fun. You get to, to go up to the plate and hit a, a double or a home run. Like, that's exhilarating. Um, so getting to work on your hitting can be a lot more fun, but um, I've always, for whatever reason, loved defense. And I was able to make a play recently to, to end the game on a, on a dive to get Arenado. And I sent my dad a text after the game and I said, hey dad, thanks for you know, hitting me all those balls in the yard and we'd practice our divers. You know, my brother and I, we'd practice diving for balls in the front and backyard. And uh, we just loved doing that as kids. And I think, um, you know, just that love and that practice that I had um, has been able to kind of show up and, and as it's become a job and a career it's been something something pretty cool because when you're a kid you don't want your dad 
or your brother or your friend to throw it right to you. Oh, no, it's not like, fun. Throw it over there so I have yeah, to dive. Yeah, so I can run and dive yeah. and then get up, yeah. So you see, uh, as a kid, you watch guys on TV and, you know, the routine plays don't look fun. The plays where guys dive or the Jeter jump throw, those are the fun plays. So um, I still kind of practice those plays now and, um, you know, obviously practice the routine play as well. But, yeah, we, we practice those plays all the time. <laughs> and... Uh, we just raid each other and try to give give each other really tough plays. And it was it was cool. You have an unusual throwing motion that's getting some attention yeah. lately. I, every time I see you throw, uh, first of all, I'm amazed at how quick this this it's it's gone like yep. that. The ball's already caught and on its way. Yep. But you have the sort of three quarter overhand. It's always reminded me, and it might be the number thirteen of Dan Marino. Because Dan Marino never got sacked because he would drop back and he had that just quick, quick release. That's what I see. When I see you throw, I see Dan Marino. Does that mean anything? Well, I've never got compared to a quarterback. That's pretty cool. But every time I throw, every, every slot that I throw the ball out of is calculated and practiced. And, um, you know, when I was in double-A back in 2013, I had the now Padres manager, Andy Green, and he was watching me take ground balls and especially the balls where I was going into my right and, you know, playing them on the run and throwing kind of sidearm and letting the ball kind of like tail a bunch. And, you know, it would look like a great play, you know, highlight, you know, top 10 play, but, you know, two or three times out of 10, the throw would sail and take the first baseman off the bag. Because you're not throwing a fastball over there. Suddenly you're throwing a slider yeah, or something. Yeah, he's throwing something that's moving too much and it's hard to control. So he came up to me one day and was like, hey, why don't you try to take that ball and throw it more over the top to, to have it stay true? And I was like, I never really thought about that. And I started to work on it and work on it. And I noticed I could almost pretty much hit the guy in the chest at first every single time. And I was like, wow, I like that. Over the years, I've tried to really work on, you know, that exchange you're talking about getting rid of the ball quickly and something I work on almost every day in the off season and in my footwork to put myself in a position to catch and get rid of it quick. So um, it's all calculated and practiced and, and something I'm working on continually each day. Cup of Coffee is presented by First Watch Restaurants, the Daytime Cafe. What do we got? I know you guys are probably full, but you have oh, to wow. try our Floridian French toast. Oh my goodness, look at, at this. Get your carbs in before there. the game oh, tonight. Man. All right. Thank you. All right, Thank you. dig in guys. That looks awesome. First watch, they take good care of us. Yes, food is good. Sasai bowl is, is fantastic. Do you think the average fan would be surprised about how much thought and technique goes into just fielding a ground ball? I mean, all the things you're talking about. Yeah. It, it's an amazing amount of planning and yeah. practice and, and attention to technique and detail, isn't it? You know, we get asked questions all the time like, you know, hey, you guys play so many games, you guys ever have a practice? You know, they think, yeah, they think we just show up to the park. You guys at, are there at 11 noon and the game's yeah, at 7. They think we show up to the park in a half hour, hour before the game and get dressed and go play like they did in Little League. But, you know, we're there, like you're saying, seven, six, seven hours before the game and, you know, in the video room studying and we're in the cage and we're out in the field taking ground balls and, you know, we practice every single day before the game. Every time I go to the, I usually get to the park about 2, 2.30 for a home game at 6.40. Yeah. And I've done a bunch of work at home before I get there. Yeah. But I get there and you guys are already well into infield or batting practice or the yeah, yeah. high velocity machine, whatever it is that day. Yeah. It's amazing how, I'm constantly amazed at how you guys do it because I know how tired I am right now. <laughs> and I'm not doing anything. <laughs> but it, it's every day and it's all day every day. Yeah. That, that to me is the amazing part about this game and, and what the players go through. I think just like anything, if you're at the top of your profession, um, you better be working at it really hard. You know, there's there's seven, eight levels of the minor leagues and guys want to take our jobs. So, um, you know, we don't approach it out of fear or anything like that, but uh, it's just a reality. And if you don't continually get better, uh, you're going to get passed by quickly. So, like you said, yourself, uh, you're working before you come to the park and then you get there at 2 or 2.30 and got stuff going on until the game and then after the game. So, um, you know, I'm sure your routine didn't start like that um, when you first started. I'm sure it's evolved. Yeah, I used to get um, to the ballpark at 8 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> I found out that was too early. Oh, way too early. <laughs> yeah, what, what was, how has your routine changed day to day as you've kind My of routine? Gotten, yeah, um, a little more experience. Do less. Yeah. Try, like, by design. 
when I first started this job, I, I had every stat, I had every guy's life story, yeah, I yeah. did all the homework, I stayed up all night, I got up early, crammed it, I came in. Yeah. I came in ready to hunt, man. I had every little thing I might need in the game, and then you end up, as Kirk Gibson said, because he had had some broadcast experience, you end up trying to use all that stuff instead of just, you know, if I come in with this much, use this much. Yeah. And those are always the best games, and it took me a while to get there. That's cool hearing that. You know, everybody that I've talked to, as a player, the routines have evolved. You know, when I first got called up to the big leagues, my routine was a lot different than it is now. And, you know, spent more time doing certain things and less time doing others. And like you're saying, too, it's not necessarily about how much work you do, but the quality, I think, of the work you yeah. do. And um, that, for me, has been huge this year and, and last year as well, just, just making sure my work is really quality and, and it's planned and there's a purpose behind it instead of just going out to work and work and work and work. You know what they call that? They call that, at the end, being a veteran. Yeah. You, you, you got to do it. The only way you can learn it is to go through it. Yeah. Yeah, my buddy back home, who I, I hit with, he's kind of like my, my off-season uh, hitting consultant and coach, and, and he talks about you have to, for young kids especially, you have to learn how to work hard first, and then you can dial it back and work smart. And I think that's so true. You have to create a really good work ethic, you know, and then understand what things you need and what things you don't, and, and kind of hone into that sweet spot. Let's hone in on this food. Yeah, they, they take, great, take some great care of us here at First Watch. That French toast? I'm gonna have you have one. I'll have the others. All is that, right. is that cool? Good.